Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, and welcome to Overruled, How to Check Your Judges. This conversation is hosted by the Tribe and Injustice Watch. I'm your moderator, Morgan Elise Johnson, publisher and co-founder of the Tribe, a digital publication with a mission to reshape the narrative of Black Chicago. Injustice Watch is a nonpartisan, nonprofit journalism organization that conducts in-depth research exposing institutional failures that obstruct justice and equality. Joining me today is Maya Dumatuva. Maya is a senior reporter at Injustice Watch covering judges in the courts. Before joining the organization in 2021, she was a senior staff writer at the Chicago Reader, where she began working in 2016. Maya was born in St. Petersburg, Russia, and immigrated to the U.S. at the age of nine. She's a current Chicago resident. Thank you so much, Maya, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Joining me also is Aislinn Pulley. She is the co-executive director at the Chicago Torture Justice Center and a longtime organizer who has worked on a variety of campaigns, including the Reparations Now movement to pass the historic 2015 Reparations Ordinance for Survivors of CPD Torture campaigns for justice for families who have lost loved ones to police violence, defense campaigns to free political prisoners and many other. Born and raised in Chicago, Aislinn founded the Chicago chapter of Black Lives Matter and was the youngest founding member of the cultural nonprofit that used art for social change called Insight Arts. Among many, many other things, thank you so much Aislinn for being here. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Okay, let's jump right into our conversation. And again, hello to everybody joining us. Um, virtually, you all can join the chat, tell us what you're thinking, ask questions, and we'll do our best to address them. All right, so it's officially election season. We're right in the middle of the midterms. So uh, Maya, if you can just uh, break down, what do judges do? They're going to be on our ballot. So what do they do? What's their impact on our daily lives? And if you can just break it down in terms of the different types of courts. So let's start with the Supreme Court. Sure. Uh, so judges are uh, the elected officials that tend to be the most low profile people on our on our ballot every time we vote. But they definitely make the most high impact decisions in terms of uh, people's day to day lives. So anything from, uh, you know, deciding what uh, this state of, you know, ac access to abortion is uh, in our in our state um, to, you know, your traffic tickets to your foreclosure or your eviction case to how child custody is going to be divvied up in your divorce um, to whether or not you are guilty of a crime. Um, how you're going to divvy up your inheritance after a loved one passes away. So judges touch, uh, you know, every aspect of people's lives, essentially. And um, they are elected officials in Illinois. And when you go to court for any reason in Cook County, uh, two thirds of the judges that are presiding over cases in Cook County are actually elected by us members of the public. So more likely than not, you're going to be in front of a judge that you have at one point or another seen on your ballot. So to get back to your question about the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court of Illinois is uh, kind of similar to what you think of when you think of the United States Supreme Court. It's essentially the highest court in our state, and they are the ultimate decider about whether or not um, laws are constitutional in accordance with the Illinois Constitution. So these are people who are deciding issues on a very high level. This isn't, you know, your traffic court tickets usually don't end up uh, in, in at, you know, with uh, through an appeals process in the Supreme Court. Um, very few cases get heard in the Supreme Court. And if they are, they're usually uh, very high profile issues that are really about um, interpretation of, of state law. Thank you so much for that insight. So the Supreme Court is dealing with like huge policy decisions, basically. Yeah, exactly. OK. And in order to get a case into the Supreme Court, usually they start out at the local level. So at any in any given county, 
you will have some kind of case uh, where, you know, maybe it's a civil lawsuit, maybe it's a criminal case that deals with some kind of, you know, complicated legal issue usually. So after the case plays out in your local court, then it would go to the appellate court, you know, one side or the other, usually whoever loses, will appeal the decision to that to a higher court, which would be the, the appellate court. And on your ballot, uh, when you go to vote, if you haven't already, you'll see six appellate court justices who are, um, who are be asking for another term on the appellate court. Um, and then the Supreme Court, so after the appellate court may make a decision on the case, the uh, losing party in that scenario can then ask the Supreme Court to take a look at the case. And for the most part, the Supreme Court turns down these requests. Uh, but the few cases they take, it's like you said, it's like high level kind of legal interpretation policy stuff. Okay, what about the circuit court? Can you give us a, qu a quick crash course on what the circuit court does? Yeah, so that's the court you think of when you think about like being in court. So, you know, whether you're contesting a traffic ticket, you're, I don't know, getting married, uh, you're dealing with, uh, you know, the the estate or inheritance of, of like a loved one that you're you're trying to figure out how to manage amongst the surviving relatives, whether you've been accused of a crime, um, whether you're, you know, yeah, getting divorced, whether you're having a domestic violence issue, the kind of court that you go to to deal with all of that stuff, all of that life stuff is going to be your county circuit court. So the most of the judges that you're going to see on your ballot when you go to vote are the Cook County Circuit Court judges. And they're asking, they're asking you to keep them on the bench for another six year term. And you have to vote yes or no to keeping them on the bench. Thank you so much. And y'all feel free to be active in the comments. If anything doesn't make sense, we want to hear from you. Um, Aislinn, I want to go to you now. Um, I know that you are a revolutionary. I've been following you in your work. You've been really um, organizing on behalf of Black Lives and just making um, Chicago a safer, more just place. Um, so tell me, how do judges impact your organizing work? They have enormous impact. Um, if we understand the system of incarceration in this country um, and really sit with the reality that we live in the country that has the largest incarceration rate in the world and in history, then the role of judges has really incredible importance because judges determine often the length of, of, of a prison sentence, of incarceration sentence, and they're the ones who determine whether or not cases can move forward, can be dismissed, you know, and, and so there's a lot of power there. So the role of the judge is, is really often um, invisibilized, I think, in the dominant consciousness of how we understand um, the way that incarceration operates. And so when we have in, like we have in Cook County um, and like we have in Chicago, judges that don't really reflect the population of, of the majority of people who are being incarcerated, who are facing detention, who are being criminalized, then we have a huge discrepancy in not just um, how sentencing and um, um, incarceration rates are affected and by whom, but have really um, um, huge discrepancies in any argument around representative democracy, right? So if we, if we want to have an argument that we live in a representative democracy, then who our judges are and who the population that is most affected, it does not match at all. And so we can, you know, we can, we, we have been able to link and pinpoint the history of policing um, as, as really being rooted in, in this country and in, in slavery and with slave patrols. Um, we should also link the judiciary in that way as well. Um, and the judiciary comes out of that also. So the structure of the laws, how they're implemented, who decides them also comes out of the slaveocracy. And there hasn't been enough attention yet placed on the judiciary um, to, to really uh, radically unseat um, a lot of judges that are upholding, you know, the old guard, you know, quote unquote, um, but really upholding the system of white supremacy 
uh, that really has absolutely no democratic representation, if that's what you're looking for, um, to the population that is that is the most affected by its power. Thank you so much for offering that. Um, and, and Maya, I want to speak to you a little bit more about Injustice Watch, because I feel like you all have such a unique role and angle in Chicago's media landscape. So can you just speak more about the role that Injustice Watch's um, journalism plays in holding judges accountable? Sure, yeah. So this organization got started um, in uh, 2015, um, and the the work, the the journalism work here, really is rooted in uh, reporting about wrongful convictions, and about some of this legacy that um, Aislin is referring to in the local courts of you know people basically getting you know abused and tortured by police into confessing to crimes they didn't commit, you know, prosecutors going along with approving charges against people, and then people ending up, you know, in prison doing life for murders that they never committed. Um, oftentimes folks ended up on death row, which, you know, all those sentences were commuted in the early 2000s. But the founders of Injustice Watch were people who were deeply concerned with this with this legacy and um, who wanted to kind of shine a light on the way that people who essentially had some part in this dark history continued to um, play a role in the justice system. Uh, what was kind of found over time is that People, you know, who were prosecutors at one point or another, who may have worked on some of these uh, cases where police were abusing, torturing, coercing people into confessing to crimes they didn't commit, um, or t t into into confessing unconstitutionally, essentially, even if they may actually have committed whatever crime it was. Uh, so the people who played a part in those cases as state's attorneys, a few years down the line, they would get elected as judges and they would preside over criminal cases in Cook County. And there would kind of never be any scrutiny over like, okay, what was this person doing before they became a judge? And so um, I think that the, the work of Injustice Watch is really rooted in a kind of like, let's take stock of like how these legacies in our local criminal legal system continue to play out and affect people over time. And as the organization got going, another crucial component of this became uh, creating a voter guide that would be nonpartisan. It doesn't endorse anyone. It doesn't tell you how to vote, but it com comprehensively uh, c combines all the information that you can find out there about all of these judges. So both people who run for judge and people who are already on the bench and are up for retention, like we're gonna see in November. So our first judicial election guide, um, they started doing it in 2016 and now we've grown a lot and the guide is available online at injusticewatch.org slash judges. We also have a lot of print uh, copies of the guide out there all over Cook County as well. But basically what it does is, is give you all the information you need to make an informed decision. And people might be surprised to find as, as they use the guide and they approach their, their ballot um, that most of the judges that you're gonna see on your ballot are not judges in criminal courts. So there's actually only like three judges who are gonna be on your ballot in November uh, on, this, on this November ballot uh, who are currently hearing cases at like the county's main criminal courthouse at 26 in California. So when you think about like the criminal legal system and the kind of big important cases that happen in Cook County, of the 61 people on this ballot, only three of them have anything to do with those cases right now. So, um, and actually one of them transferred out of the criminal division last year. So it's really just two people. So um, it, it's also part of what the guide does, I think, and what our work does is kind of educate people about what the court is beyond just the criminal courthouse, um, because 
the local court system impacts people's lives in so many ways. And especially, um, you know, when you think about racial disparities in the court system, they play out not just in the criminal in criminal cases, but also very often in civil cases. These are issues about people's homes, people's money, people's, you know, people's child custody, all of these things, uh, which really especially impact women um, are are playing out in the civil side of the court. And that's really most of most of our local court system. And most of these judges are handling those kinds of cases. Thank you. That's that's really good to know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious. Judges tend to be discreet. They're usually not out doing community events and outreach, and we don't see many political ads about judges. Do you think they bank on the public being misinformed about them and their role in the justice system? And why do you think that is? Aislinn, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I, I think that um, judges bank, bank on that, certainly. And, and I think the system as a whole relies on that. Um, I think, you know, because of, and we can look and identify many ways in which the system is very flawed and prevents people from having full transparent access to information. Um, and one of, one of them, you know, one of the most famous ways really is the electoral college, right? We have an electoral college that was created in order to prevent actual direct democratic access to voting in, you know, our, our president. Um, and the ways that the judicial system operates is similar in that it's cloaked in a lot of mystery um, and there's a lot of smoke and mirrors involved. It's very, it, it seems very complicated. It's not a common sense, um, uh, 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 it, it's not designed in a common sense way. You have to really study it. And so we have organizations like Injustice Watch that came into being as a direct result of the fact that People are so ill-informed and intentionally uninformed about judges uh, because it's one of the most powerful ways in which the uh, incar the, the system of mass incarceration, which um, dominates our legal system, operates. So I, I, I think it's very accurate to say that there is a deep intentionality about keeping it cloaked in mystery keeping people uninformed um, uh, as to how judges operate, how they obtain their seats, and how to recall them you know, if a population desires to do so. All of that um, needs to be massively um, understood by the population so that we can then change it and make it representative of, of a system that is actually fair, that is invested in our livelihoods instead of one that has been imposed on us um, out of a slaveocracy that was destroyed, right? Uh, or at least legally destroyed. So I think there's certain intentionality there for sure. Maya, do you have anything to add to that of like why the, the judicial system isn't as transparent? Yeah, I, I mean, I will, uh, I think the the other, aspect of this, uh, the reason why all of this um, is so obscure to the public, I think, is because judges, well, they're, they're like, part of this is like a media problem. You know, the judicial branch of our local government does not get nearly the same kind of coverage as like the legislative branch, you know, your city council, your county board, or the executive branch, which is like your mayor's office and your you know, county board president and all the offices underneath that branch of government, like the executive and legislative branch get a lot of attention from the press. We tend to know more or less what's going on there, but the judicial branch of government really doesn't get, doesn't get that kind of uh, attention. It's not seen as like a, you know, interesting, sexy aspect of local government to cover. So that combined with like shrinking local media there, you just have like very little presence in the courts of like independent observers and reporters telling people about what's going on. And the presence that is in the courts is all focused on the criminal courts. And the kind of coverage that comes out of that is mostly sensationalized coverage, you know, about like, again, like about basically allegations about like people getting accused of crimes that haven't yet been, you know, you have a million stories about people getting charged, arrested, what their bond might be. But usually you never find out what happens to these cases. You never hear about acquittals. 
when they happen. If so, you know, you'll you can Google someone's name and find out if they were arrested and charged with a crime, but you won't know like what were they actually even, you know, what what ended up happening. So there's like there's a kind of uh, fail like a failure of other public institutions alongside this. But the other I think reason why judges tend to be so low profile is is because there are these like special rules in Illinois that prevent judges from campaigning or kind of being put in a position to be accountable for themselves the way that like other politicians are essentially. So, you know, anyone running for any public office, you can, you know, you expect them to say something about like what they plan to do, what their position on different issues are. You can kind of get a sense of like, what do these, you know, what do these people stand for? If I'm going to vote for you, like, what do you, what do you represent? What are your values, et cetera? Judges are uh, like not supposed to offer any opinions about any issues, any political issues that might at some point come up in a case that they have to rule on because they're supposed to be like these neutral kind of people. But of course that mean, that ends up meaning that like they don't offer any kind of, you know, any, any uh, insight on what they stand for, what they believe in, what their values are. And they you know care. what, I want to dig, I want to dig into that. Like, uh, cause I do, I want to talk about judicial bias. We're kind of taught, you know, when we learn about the three branches of government that, you know, judges are supposed to be impartial, that they're objective, that they just, you know, make rulings and in, in their personal feelings and there's don't, play a part and they don't have a bias. But um, we're starting to see um, very clear political motives play out, um, at least in the United States, you know, Supreme Court. Um, it, like it's, it's, it's looking to be pretty obvious, you know, the ways in which um, our Supreme Court are showing political motives and like making policies that very much align with, you know, um, certain party affiliations. So can you talk a little bit about um, your work, Maya, um, as it, it comes to um, talking about judicial bias. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it, it can be hard to figure out exactly, uh, you know, what how 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 somebody's bias plays out. But one tool we have for that is to see if a judge has actually ever been called out for having some kind of bias by a higher court. So when um, an appellate court reverses a judge's decision. So when a, the appellate court reverses a circuit court judge's ruling, um, usually, it, first of all, reversals are pretty rare. And usually when they do happen, it'll be like pretty cut and dried. Like the appellate court will write up an opinion, like they'll write up a document that's available to the public that'll explain why they're basically undoing a decision that a judge made. Um, sometimes though, the appellate court will take the rare step to say like this judges this judge has like a personal bias in you know in, in what in whatever way that they rule on the case it's obvious that there's some kind of bias here and that's a problem and so part of the you know it, it's it's kind of a limitation of the way that the judicial system works uh that that we don't have a lot of insight on this but sometimes when it does come up it should be like a really pretty significant red flag. So, I mean, one judge I recently reported on who is on the retention ballot um, right now, uh, Charles Burns, he has been reversed uh, by the appellate court 40 times in this last term, which is more than any other criminal court judge uh, working in the county. And in, for example, in one reversal, the appellate court said like this judge seems to have like some kind of pro police bias because he found that a police officer was able to identify someone from 150 feet away that they saw for five seconds which doesn't seem humanly <laughs> realistic but uh the judge said that like because this was a police officer he had special powers to do that so there's there's stuff like that that's like very um explicit but i would say that like another way that you can evaluate a judge's perspective is to see what were they doing with their lives before they were a judge because maybe they won't tell you about how where they stand on the issue of police violence in the city of chicago but if they spent their entire career in law enforcement before becoming a judge that's a different life choice than being a public defender 
mm -hmm. than being, you know, a civil rights attorney. So this is why our guide has a lot of that information about what these folks were doing with their lives before they became judges. I want to let Aislinn jump in here. Um, can you talk more about your perspective on judicial bias and kind of like what's at stake politically for us here in Illinois? Sure, I think um, there, there's a supposition that the law as, as, as a whole, and then um, by extension judges um, uh, are, are somehow neutral. And, it, and, and that's just a falsehood. It's just th th that it's just not true, right? Judges hold like every single person holds political opinions and thinking um, and, and operates from that standpoint. The law in and of itself is written to uphold the current system of power and, and distribution. And that's what, that's what the legal system does. It, it is there to define and regulate um, how, in fact, um, uh, the system is able to operate, who has the, the permission to do what and when and how. Um, so there is there is a necessary need to be very critical and to remove the cloak of mystery that often the legal system relies upon um, to, to, to make it plain and to really speak um, in a way that is very clear and removes the, the smoke and mirrors from it. There isn't actually anything mysterious about how the law works or how judges work. Um, many judges um, have uh, become judges after decades working in state's attorneys or district attorney's offices as prosecutors. Many prosecutorial offices like state's attorney's offices um, maybe not so much in Chicago, Illinois, but certainly decades uh, past, beginning with Anita Alvarez on back to Edward Hanrahan, who was a part of you know, the assassination of Chairman Fred Hampton and Deputy Mark Clark, worked hand in hand with police departments. So the perspective of who is a criminal and what is criminal um, is colored by that, that life experience, right? So if you have a whole department that that is a part of the local government that is operating hand in hand with the local police district, then who is considered criminal and what chances they have of a quote unquote fair trial um, is really skewed and really affected in that way. So it's really important to demystify um, um, how we understand uh, the legal system and how judges work and to really uh, demand accountability. Um, so the organizing work that took place in 2018 where the movement was able to really, uh, for the first time in almost uh, two decades or, or three decades, remove a sitting judge has had enormous impact. Where we are now moving forward is, is really important. We're at a critical point in our history in being able to uh, further deepen some of the wins that we were able to gain over the course of the last decade and prevent a conservative backlash that is actively being organized. So we can even look at the Supreme Court and we see the removal of Roe v. Wade. We see the other very conservative right-wing attempts at um, pushing back and eliminating wins that we thought were, were, were pretty um, secure for many years are now being withered away. We also see with that a reorganization of power that is happening and that is in part a backlash against the movement and in part a way of the system trying to figure out and reassert its power post movement uprising of, of 2020. So there is a lot of racist attacks, a lot of white supremacist um, rhetoric that is becoming more and more in line with um, overtly admitted white supremacists like the Proud Boys, et cetera, that are seeing itself become more visible in our judiciary, in our, um, uh, in, in, our, in our legal system. We have sitting judges who were, for example, judge, um, uh, who were the captains or presidents of their local Republican parties um, in their suburban villages. Um, they're, they're like with uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice um, um, uh, Clarence Thomas's wife, who was actively um, organizing uh, uh, to keep Trump in power, right? All of those have massive impact 
into an insight into, into where they are functioning and operating from. So the illusion that there is neutrality is actually a lie. There's no neutrality. Every single person has a political position. It's our job as the outside, as the, as the people, to push, to demand transparency and accountability. State, state what your position is. Do you support affirmative action? Do you support these things? Do you support the movement? Do you support um, uh, you know, a, a whole plethora of things um, that, that we're struggling with right now? Um, I, I think it's important that we push back against the performance of neutrality that is actually false and demand our judiciary to take public positions yeah, and I, I think that, that that's a really great point. And one of the ways that um, we try to do this actually with our guide is we send out a survey to all of the judges who are on the ballot, asking them a few questions about themselves and their and their and their stances on things. Um, and to me, that like, the most important question that we asked uh, was to, you know, what like what is how do you grapple with the power that you hold over people's lives. Um, and I think it's very telling the way that people, these judges answer these questions. So most of the judges responded to our survey and a good number of them uh, responded in very like, just vague ways to this question about power. But some of them really actually seem to engage with it and gave and it seemed to give thoughtful answers about it. So, you know, the, it's we're always trying to find ways to get these judges on the record about what where, where they stand on stuff by asking questions that are going to be like they can't just like bow out of and say, oh, like the rules say I can't, oh, you know, I can't offer my opinion on this. So I would say that's another interesting thing you can find in the guide. But to the issue of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, and specifically the Illinois Supreme Court, um, I just wanted to add as well that like, we have two incredibly important uh, Supreme Court races going on in Illinois on this ballot. If you are a voter in Cook County though, you will not see these Supreme Court races on your ballot because these are in the second and third Supreme Court district. This is not Cook County. Uh, these are not Cook County voters that are voting in those, in those districts. But it's all the basically Cook County, collar suburban counties. And there are, if, if the Republicans win in both of these races, the Supreme Court in Illinois would be majority Republican for the first time since like 1968. And actually, um, I'm dropping uh, an article in the chat that my colleagues just did about the importance of these races and what it would mean for reproductive rights. Um, for example, in Illinois, but also a slew of other issues. So um, it's really uh, important to pay attention to what's happening at your local state Supreme Court level as well. Aislinn, did you have anything to add? I mean, I'm so glad that we're talking about bias because um, the tribe, we really take a, a hard stance on bias and objectivity when it comes to media by saying that, you know, we state our bias. We're, we're coming from a Black liberatory framework and we are um, holding power to account and uplifting narratives that um, that that deepen, you know, issues within the community. Um, so can you talk a little bit about like, again, digging into judicial bias and how it applies to laws that have really blown up in the media, such as, you know, the Safety Act and things like that? Yeah, um, one of the most important things that that is happening now and that that will require really close watch um, and uh, is something that I really applaud Tribe for, for taking a lead on and, and being very um, um, at the forefront of sharing information about is the Safety Act. Uh, Illinois, we have accomplished a really remarkable feat that that it has the potential of being overturned, um, which is the um, the bond reform movement that we were able to push and win through the Safety Act. And the Safety Act would, in effect, eliminate cash, cash bail um, in Illinois, thereby uh, making Illinois the first state in the country 
uh, to do that. And the reason why this is really important is that cash bail is used dis uh, in, uh, indiscriminately against poor people. It is a system of detainment that relies upon people being able to come up with a certain amount of money to allow them to not remain in jail pre-trial. So this is this is before people have had the the chance to um, state their case, to argue their their case in court. They are held in detention, and sometimes this can last for many, many, many years. And people have um, uh, there there are many people who have died awaiting trial. And um, and, and I re I recall visiting people as a child in Cook County Jail because we weren't rich enough or didn't have enough money in order to bond them out free trial. So this is a really important win that we were able to secure that is in, in deep jeopardy of being overturned. Um, right now, we have been facing a onslaught of propaganda uh, by um, the right wing uh, in Illinois that has invested um, over $30 million in ads attacking the Safety Act. And it has been putting forward all this fear mongering, alleging that there is a purge coming to Illinois. That is just patently false. It's a lie. What, it, what will happen is that people will not be held indefinitely pre-trial um, uh, uh, in, in detention um, based on their ability to pay a monetary bond. That is what is going to happen. And that is a victory for, for the majority of people um, who, who are affected by this. The data that we have and that, use, that, that we used in organizing this revealed that over 90% of people who cannot afford bonds end up pleading uh, because and, and, and making a plea deal because they are they want they want to get out as soon as possible and what that means is they give up their rights um, without having had a chance to even go through the judicial process of of, of a trial and, and et cetera et cetera so um, the fear mongering that is out there really requires close inspection I really encourage people to look at the data read the facts. Tribe did a really, really important investigation of the allegations around a purge. That's really important to read because it's coming from a, a specific population that is intent on making sure that there is no change to mass incarceration in this country. And any attempts at chipping away at it um, is met with an onslaught of uh, disinformation, and that's what we're experiencing right now. So we need to be very active and organized in disrupting that attempt um, and sharing the information that we have that is that is facts based. Absolutely, and with that, Aislinn, I want to thank you so much for being here. I know that you you have to head out, so I'm going to go ahead and just like. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for, for lending your expertise um, with us tonight and be safe. Thank you all. All right, you all don't go anywhere. I'm still here talking with Maya. I just got a couple of questions for you where we can really kind of dig into the guide and what people can really expect on their ballots because you know it is time for early voting it's time for us to head to the polls and I would encourage all of us to do it to vote early because I mean, I don't know about you, but it's kind of scary right now, the political climate. And for me, I know that I've made a plan to early vote. Um, if you planned on ordering a ballot for mail-in voting um, or to like drop off your ballot early, today is the last day to do that. So make sure you get that handled. Um, I have my ballot. I wish I had it physically with me, but you could also go to the tribe.com to see your early voting locations and where you can drop off your ballot. Um, you're right now looking at our community map, the scene. Um, so definitely navigate to the tribe.com with two eyes and then click on the scene and then navigate to um, the map to find your polling location so that you can go ahead and vote early. We don't want to take any chances. We want to be safe as possible because, yeah, 
a lot of things are going down right now. And I just want us all to be safe while exercising our right to vote. So that is my little PSA. But let's get it done, you all. Um, Maya, I just want to talk to you a little bit about like how judges are evaluated, you know, like what were kind of some of the determining factors that you all looked at when you were creating the vibe, the the guide, I mean. It's also a vibe. <laughs> it's um, a vibe to vote, y'all. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we basically uh, have over the years built like kind of a series of criteria that we look at and include um, in the guide. So when you, I'm, I'm just, Looking at my screen, I've got the guide pull, pulled up. Again, you can find that at injusticewatch.org slash judges. Um, basically, the guide is organized with people, the judges up for retention. So those are the people that you have to vote yes or no to keep them on the bench for another term. Uh, they are listed in the same order that you're going to see on your ballot. Now, you'll also see some people on your ballot who are running for vacant positions so the way you become a judge is like this it's a little bit convoluted when you're running for judge you have to run for an open seat um and because this is cook county and most political candidates that run for any position here are democrats the the, the real contest between candidates for judge happened during primary season so if you voted back in june on in in the democratic primary in cook county you would have seen a bunch of different names for each of these vacant judge positions. Those contests were decided, and if there wasn't a Republican primary you know, c c contest for any of the judicial races, then when you go to vote right now uh, or on Tuesday, uh, you're just gonna see one name you know, for those vacant seats. And it's not because nobody ran, it's just because the actual, the real contested part of this happened during the primaries. So the current Injustice Watch guide is really focusing a lot more on the uh, on the retention judges. So these are the people who already got elected and then every six years, if they're a circuit court judge and every 10 years, if they're an appellate court judge or a Supreme Court justice, they go back to the voters and ask them yes or no, you know, to keeping them on the bench. And each of these candidates has to get 60% yes votes to stay. Now, uh, no, so people can't challenge retention judges. It's all, you know, it's it's all just yes or no to keeping that person on the bench. Then if they lose, which happens very rarely, as we talked about, uh, but if they lose, then their seat becomes vacant and then people can run for that uh, in the future. So essentially, each one of these candidates, the way what, what we looked at is uh, as you go through the guide, you'll see like different icons that there, there you go. So the little candidate icons, these are just little shorthand things that is information that over the years we've found people are particularly interested in. So because so many doesn't count former prosecutors or former public defenders, we identify that as like one of the icons. We identify if they've had especially positive or negative ratings from the bar associations which uh, review judges performance and their legal abilities they but the bar associations i'm actually going to drop another link in the chat we just had a story come out today about why bar association ratings matter and in what way they're limited um but we have their ratings uh like a little icon for whether or not they've had a lot of um positive ratings or negative ratings and then we have these icons for past controversies involving the judge or notable reversals. And when it says reversals, it's talking about appellate court reversals. So like I said earlier, it's rare that judges' decisions get reversed. And so when they do, we really pay attention to that and we look at what were the reasons for those reversals. So when you scroll down in the guide, again, it's organized in the same way that your ballot is. And uh, each one of these judges will have a little info button next to them. And when you click on the info, that's where the real that's where the real meat is. That's where that's where all the information is really living. So you'll see a photo of the judge. You'll see how long they've been a judge, what their salary is. Um, you'll see a little explanation about where they're assigned, what kind of cases they handle. And this year we actually have a new feature too, where we try to explain some of the legalese. So there's you know regular people might not know like what is the 
probate division? What is the chancery division? What does it mean that somebody was an associate judge before they became elected? So whenever we have terms like that that come up in our descriptions, they're highlighted in red and you can actually like hover your mouse or click over that and it'll give you a little glossary explanation of what that means. So we hope that'll make navigating all of this a little clearer for folks. So then we'll have information about what they were doing with their careers before they became judges, what kind of lawyers they were, what they did, if they, you know, um, where they went to law school as well. Um, and then we'll have a section about uh, anything notable that we found about them. So this is where you'll find like important information about, you know, high profile cases they've handled or any controversy they've been involved in or any other just things of note that we found in our research. We both do a lot of research online about these people. We dig up everything we can about them. We look at their financial disclosures, everything. But we also interview folks that know these judges, uh, both attorneys that have practiced in front of them and people who might have had them actually on their cases, like people who've had them handle their life matters. So we include information that we find uh, in that notable section. Then we'll have an excerpt from their candidate survey. Now, if they didn't respond to our survey, it'll say this candidate did not respond to the survey. But if they did respond, then we will have a little excerpt from that and we'll have a, um, a like a place for you to click if you want to read all of their answers. So I really found these to be quite fascinating. The people that did bother to respond to the survey, some of them had very interesting things to say in, in, in response to these questions. So if you're curious, you can peruse that. And then we have um, a little kind of scale barometer type thing where we sum up all of their bar association ratings. So it's pretty, it's color coded, it's easy to read. You can see uh, most of, basically all but four of these judges this year uh, have had have all positive ratings from the bar associations. Um, and the four of them that have any negative ratings, two of those, it's like just one bar association that said that they weren't qualified to continue to be on the bench. So they're not particularly, um, they don't, I don't think they tell you a whole ton about the judge because they're all just like, yeah, these people are great. Um, so I think that some of this other information that we include in the guide can maybe help folks make a little bit more refined and uh, informed decision about whether or not they want to keep this person in our courts. Did y'all hear that? Informed decisions. What we don't want to do is show up in the voting booth and just vote yes, 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 yes down the line for everybody. I know like in my earlier voting days, I've been guilty of doing that. But when we vote yes, from what I'm hearing, Maya, we're really just like giving them a free pass to continue to be a judge. And also we're blocking like a future election from taking place. Cause like only if they get removed from the bench, do we get to then elect another judge? Is that correct? That's exactly right. Like the only way that we get new people on the bench is if there's spots that open up and the way the spots that open up is if, a, is, is if a judge loses a retention election or retires or resigns or passes away. So a lot of these people have been on the bench for a very long time. And every time that you vote yes for them, you are saying, yes, I want this person to get $200,000 a year for the next six years to continue to make decisions about the lives and livelihoods of me and my neighbors. So this is this is like a, you know, you could end up in front of this judge with your with your life issue um so it's it's really important to really kind of approach this in with trying to make an informed decision and i'll add one more thing to that so some people because i've we've gotten quite a few questions about this um this election cycle like what happens when you just leave it blank a lot of people feel like okay i don't want to vote all yes and i don't want to vote all no but i don't know who these people are so i'm just going to leave it blank when you leave it blank uh on the retention judge part of the ballot, uh, you are also having an impact on the outcome of the election. Because in order to stay on the bench, these folks need 60% yes votes of the votes that were cast, not of the ballots that were cast. So let's say, let's say like a million people voted uh, 
and a million people filled out, you know, the governor part of the ballot. That's going to be the top of our ballot right now. Um, but then only half a million people filled in the judges part of the ballot. So then the judges who are getting reelected with 60% yes votes, they're only getting reelected by 60% of that half a million people that bothered to vote. So by not voting, you are making the you're shrinking the pool of votes in play and essentially making it easier for folks to get reelected. So it's it's particular, you know, when it comes to like the uncontested races for vacant seats, you know, even if two people voted, like the, there's going to be a winner. And, and anyway, there's going to there's there's like these races were decided back in during the primary election. But with the retention judges, not voting is changing the metrics of the game essentially so that's just another 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 kind of pitch to like just make an informed decision use the guide and and make a choice uh because if you if you leave it blank you are also participating in a way that matters and we'll make sure to drop the guide in our comments and a number of other guides because you know the Injustice Watch guide is incredibly thorough. I mean, it has a lot of good information in there. I've taken a look at it and I'm so glad that I'm voting from home because what I don't want to do is bring that entire guide to the voting booth. Even though you can, you can bring notes yeah. to the voting booth, okay? So no excuses there. You um, I you can print it out. You can yep. get a print copy of it from Southside Weekly or the reader right now. You, yeah, you can, I always like to vote on election day and I just bring that thing in there and I just take forever, but that's, yeah, <laughs> that's just me. Oh um, yeah, I'm definitely an in and out type of person. So, <laughs> um, okay, so I know we we've talked longer than we said we were gonna talk, Maya. But it's been a pleasure. I just want to leave you with one last question that I just thought of. There are so many people who feel like you know voting is not enough. Voting doesn't make enough of an impact. Are there other ways that we can be involved in the judicial system and really make a difference in the day to day lives of Chicagoans? Well, I would say that outside of voting for these judges, I mean, the, the the big way that you can have an impact on the court system is is really just through treating it as the public space that it is. So, you know, the courts are open to the public. Court watching is something that anybody can do for any reason. Like if you want to, unless it's, it's, it's something involving children, like, um, juvenile court cases or, you know, child custody cases or things like that, that involve kids whose confidentiality is protected automatically. Um, any kind of court hearing that happens in your community is like open to the public to observe. So, you know, we in the media, we in Injustice Watch anyway, uh, part of our role is to try to do that court watching and, and, and report on what's happening in our local courtrooms. But if you're out of there in the community and you're looking for a way to, um, you know, pl plug in and or develop some kind of organizing around uh, the judicial branch of government, I'd say that besides besides the election time, the the thing that's open to you always is is court watching and 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 just like fo following cases, um, you know, making records about how judges are behaving how they're resolving cases, what's happening, you know, what just what's happening in the courtroom. A lot of these courtrooms also don't have uh, court reporters or any recording equipment. People assume that there's always some stenographer, you know, typing away, making transcripts. That's only true in criminal court, but lots of cases there's that just doesn't exist um, on the civil side. So I guess that would be my suggestion is uh, you can, you can, uh, it's, it's, it's really fer fertile territory. I, I haven't seen anybody in Chicago other than some, you know, lawyers groups do systematic court watching. Um, and so that's, that's, that's out there for folks to consider. Is there anything that you recommend we do to be prepared to be a court watcher? Like, what is that? Does that mean just showing up to court? How do we, how do we do that? Yeah. I mean, you, you can show up to court and, you know, take notes on what you see. There are, there, are, it's, again, it's like a public space. It's just like showing up to like any city council hearing, um, any kind of public hearing for, you know, the Chicago Public Schools Board or, I don't know, Chicago Housing Authority Board. 
anyone can come and just watch what happens. You can tweet about it. The Chicago, um, the city bureau documenters do a lot of this kind of like basic public meeting watching and tweeting um, in the in in the executive and legislative branches of government. But that kind of thing can you know you you can do that kind of thing in the courts as well. So a lot of times it's hard to understand what's happening in a courtroom until you've like gone a few times and just kind of watched and seen like what is the normal process. People kind of speak in this legalese mumbo jumbo. A lot of times, like I mean, when I first start showing up to see a case for a story I might want to report, it takes me a while to just like get the hang of like what are people saying. But um, but yeah, it's uh, you know it's free and open to the public. And if anyone tells you you can't watch, if it's not a case that involves kids, then you, you that that is wrong. Nobody can keep you out of a courtroom. That's part of your local government. Wow, I definitely learned something today. Thank you so much for um, all of this wealth of information that you've given us. And I hope anybody watching, um, I hope you are inspired to be a more um, engaged and active citizen as we really try to fight for our democracy and the and our own personal values. I hope you are doing that through voting. I hope that you do that. Um, through the through your media diet and the the media that you consume, I hope that you do that just by being a good neighbor and um, helping those around you. So don't forget to make a plan to vote. Go to um, the tribe.com. Go to the scene and see where your um, drop off locations are, your early voting locations are, and definitely make a plan to vote. And um, yeah, we'll we'll drop those guides in there. We'll make sure to um, drop a bunch of different guides because there's a lot of information out there about voting. You don't have to go at this alone. We are here. And Amaya, you all are having a ballot party, aren't you? Why don't you yep. plug that really quickly? Uh, yeah, Monday the 7th uh, in the evening. Uh, at South, we're collaborating with Southside Weekly and the uh, Harvey World Herald. We're going to be at Build Coffee. Um, let me uh, let me not lie to you about the time. I think we're starting. Uh, let me just pull the time up. Make sure I'm not lying. Um, we'll be at Build Coffee in Woodlawn at uh, set, at five to seven p.m. on Monday. You can come and pick up some print versions of the guide. Uh, we'll get you some free dinner. We'll get you some free drink. And uh, we, if you have, you know, any community organization you're part of, your church, your block club, your, you know, PTA group, whatever, uh, you can come pick up some guides, distribute them to your friends and neighbors, to your community organization. And um, yeah, that's uh, Build Coffee. It's 6100 South Blackstone. That's where we'll be Monday night, 5 to 7 p.m. All right, Chicago, thank you so much for being here. Make sure you like and share this video. Somebody needs this information. Judges are in our lives. There's nothing we can really do about it right now. This is the system that we have, so we might as well um, get involved. So um, Maya, thank you again for being here and to the Injustice Watch family. We love, love, love to partner with y'all. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. You're doing vital work in Chicago's media landscape that really, really makes a difference in our lives. So um, to everybody else out there, um, stay safe and vote. Thank you.